Good morning, and thank you for, for joining us for the annual Love Will Blake uh, Budget Review. I'm Richard Porrick. I'm the business and politics editor of the Eastern Daily Press and other titles in the Archant Group in the East of England. Very shortly, some of uh, Love Will Blake's experts are going to be getting into the weeds of the budget and, uh, and, and, and the stuff behind the headlines and explaining exactly what Rishi Sunak's statement um, on Wednesday means for you and for your business. Uh, I personally was struck by the positivity of the delivery in the House of Commons. Clearly the government want to at least attempt to lift the gloom that has been stalking us for close to two years now in the shape of COVID. Now, of course, in practice, that is easier uh, said than done. But after speaking to a few senior uh, sources over the past 48 hours, as far as optics go, uh, I can tell you that the government are really very pleased with how the budget has gone down. Um, but all that, of course, could be lost uh, very easily. If this winter is reminiscent um, of that of 1978-79, a period which sealed the government's fate and heralded in a new era um, for Britain, only time will tell what lies in store, of course. But let's hope um, at least that the weather is not quite as brutal as it was during those dark few months at the end of the 1970s. And looking out of the window here, it certainly looks a lot more pleasant uh, at the moment. So later on, we're going to be hearing from uh, Natalie Miller, senior tax consultant at Love Blake and tax partner Colin Fish. Um, and there will be an opportunity for questions. If you could please pop those uh, in the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom uh, of your screen. We will get to them at the end. Uh, but first, please, enough from me. Let me pass you over to Mark Proctor, senior partner at Love Blake. Thank you, Richard, and good morning to you all. Welcome again to our online budget event. Uh, I'm Mark Proctor, senior partner for the firm. And as Richard has said, our speakers, Natalie and Colin, will guide you through key aspects from the budget announcement earlier this week. Uh, we're very pleased to be partnered again with the EDP and to have Richard with us this morning as a business editor. Uh, as Richard said, he'll be helping to chair the Q&A questions at the end of the presentation. So do please use the chat feature uh, to post your questions. And it's great to see so many of you with us uh, today, especially as it's half term as well. We're conscious that some people are, are away. Uh, running this event virtually has allowed a wider audience to join us today. And I'm pleased to say we had well over 100 people signed up to join us. And it's, it's also great that we're able to welcome clients and guests from much further afield. So it's nice that we're able able to reach you too with an online event. Uh, so thank you for joining us and I'll hand over to Natalie now. Good morning everybody. I'm the first one to try and share my screen so that's always the first challenge of the morning. Hopefully um, you can now see my screen. If uh, somebody could just uh, wave a hand just to make sure that I can see you um, on that would be lovely. Super, thank you very much. So one of the inevitable things with uh, budgets and statements is that initially, um, particularly this time, you look through and you think, oh, it's not really very much about tax. And certainly this year, it was much more about the economy trying to um, level up, to use the government's phrase, trying to increase skills, trying to get people back into work, all of those sorts of issues. And also, as has happened in recent years, quite a lot of the announcements had been um, uh, given beforehand. So what we're going to do is to um, include the things that were mentioned beforehand just so that you're clear on what's coming in or due to come in shortly. Then we will mention a few new things that came in and we'll also mention a couple of the non-tax things just so that you have um, some idea of context as well. Okay so let's start with uh, the basics and quite a few um, times during my presentation you'll see a little asterisk and that's just simply to um, note that these are all things that have been previously announced but in this case it's worth just um, confirming some of the basic points so the personal allowance um, is fixed for a number of years now it's not going to change as is the higher rate threshold and the upper earnings limits. So um, obviously that's a way of increasing the tax take without actually um, directly increasing taxes um, in terms of announcing rate ch changes, but obviously it leads to increased income, which the 
um, government need at the moment. We have been told that um, from 2026, 27 onwards, we'll go back to allowances being uprated by um, the Consumer Prices Index. Whether that actually happens, um, obviously there's no guarantee on that. We'll have to wait and see. The uh, one thing that was confirmed was the savings rate band at being confirmed at um, £5,000. So no change, but that, um, that non-change was confirmed, if you see what I mean. Dividend tax rates, um, it was already announced in September that there was going to be an additional rate on uh, dividends. And I've shown on the slide the comparative rates for the two years. The, um, you'll see there that all it is is a 1.25% increase on the existing range of rates. And that's reflecting um, the same increase that you will see in the national insurance, national insurance charges, which I'll mention later. The one point here to note is that whereas um, we've seen that the NI changes are for a year, after which they'll go back to normal and be replaced by a levy, of 1.25%. There's no uh, mention really of when or if the uh, dividend tax rate increase is going to continue. But these funds are again intended to support um, NHS funding and the extra funding that's been required during the pandemic. How that will be ring fenced um, isn't clear, but uh, that's the message that it, it will be. Going on to the national insurance charges, again, uh, these were um, announced in September. They affect employers, employees and the self-employed. And from 2022, you'll see a temporary 1.25% increase to um, the main rates of some, but not all, class, uh, uh, classes of national insurance. So, um, you would expect to see increases in your payments if you're an employer, if you're an employee, and also if you're self-employed. The um, class two national insurance, class three national insurance isn't affected. The other point to note is that if you're um, above state pension age, you're not affected by the increase in national insurance rates in 22-23. But in the following year, when the rates return, and it's replaced by the health and social care levy, you will be liable to that levy. The funds raised, uh, we've told, will be ring fenced for the NHS and equivalent bodies um, in 22-23, and then slightly um, different wording for the following year when it will be health and social care bodies. And this is part not only of funding um, the pandemic costs, but also, and more importantly, I think from the government's perspective, looking ahead to try to increase funding for social care provision as we go forward. One of the things we thought would be useful at this stage was just to look at what these impacts uh, what these changes mean when you're trying to get money out of your company. We quite commonly have people asking us if they're a director shareholder, well, should I take a salary or should I take dividends? And as we've mentioned, the dividend tax rates are increasing, but national insurance is increasing on your salary, both for you as an employee and you as a, um, as a company. And in addition, your corporation tax rates are increasing in the company. The It always sounds an easy thing to do, to give a comparison, but in practice, um, it's a bit of a nightmare trying to look at the different, um, the different permutations. So this is just a straightforward slide, um, and it's showing the effective tax rates if you take out either a salary or a dividend, looking at 21, 22, so the current year, and then comparing it with next year. And it makes a difference whether you're a basic rate taxpayer, a higher rate taxpayer, so paying at 40 percent or an additional rate taxpayer paying at 45. And you'll see that if you're a basic rate taxpayer, there's definitely an advantage in receiving a dividend. And that advantage continues, although reduced um, in uh, next year. However, if you're a higher rate taxpayer or an additional rate taxpayer, the existing worth having advantage 
pretty much goes when you're looking uh, next year. So it's 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 not it's not as attractive, particularly if you're an additional rate taxpayer. There are um, various assumptions that we that we've made here. I won't go through them all because um, uh, that would that would take some time. But the thing to do if you're looking at this is to ask your advisor if they can do some work with you and essentially you have to get back and do some number crunching but that just gives you a broad overview of what we're looking at for the future there are other things to remember though apart it's odd for a tax advisor to say it's not all about tax but obviously remember some of the non-tax things so if you take earnings then it's earnings for pension purposes if you have a dividend, but you um, you don't have many other dividends, you've got the advantage of having your dividend allowance, which would mean you wouldn't pay tax on the first £2,000. So there are different things to think about, as well as the practicalities. Obviously, if you're going through the salary, you need to um, go through the PAYE operation. If you're paying dividends, you need, need to make sure that your company is a position where they have sufficient reserves and um, that they can do the paperwork properly. A couple of other non-tax points just to note. Um, national living wage, obviously that's not a specifically tax issue, but if you are an employer, then you need to be, uh, you'll want to be aware both of the national minimum wage and also the national living wage if your employees are wanting to come to you to say, you know, why aren't we being paid at that level? And for some businesses, that can really be a challenge, particularly if you're working in uh, the charitable sector where your funds may be limited. So keeping an eye on that uh, national living wage is important. And then also considering, obviously, whether or not you're going to um, follow that. And all, all of that increases your costs, although obviously those costs are then tax deductible. Universal credit, we wouldn't normally talk about very much on the tax seminar, but just to note that there have been some changes. So the uh, taper rate has been reduced. So the rate at which you lose credit if you work effectively has changed and you're uh, allowed to earn an increased amount of work before uh, you lose credits. However, the much publicised extra £20 uh, cancellation has gone. So um, there are there are some changes, but um, not as much as some people would have liked. Leveling up has been a key theme of this budget, and there are a number of different things in there talking about giving households access to a support fund, vulnerable households, and a lot about skills funding. So providing work coaches for those people who are on universal credit, providing back to work support, especially for those who are older. And those um, issues, while not directly tax related, will affect you if you're an employer or obviously if you're out of work yourself, because that will um, potentially give extra funding to you as an employer if you're taking on apprentices, but it will also affect the support that you give employees if unfortunately you, you do have to let people go. Um, certainly these days, most um, employers would provide support uh, support to people on a redundancy programme. Pensions changes, these are just a couple of things um, to note. We have got some of our financial planning team um, available for the Q&A session. So we will, um, if anybody has questions on these, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get them uh, answered later. But a couple of things to note. So the state pension uh, triple lock is now a double lock. So state pension isn't going to increase by um, comparison with wages. It's only going to be measured against CPI and inflation. The pension lump sum, so the minimum age when you can access your pensions, is going to increase from 55 to 57, but not until April 2028. I think the government are trying to avoid criticisms that people who are already planning to withdraw their funds in the next couple of years would lose out. So they're pushing this back a bit to 2028 so that people have time to adjust. The pensions top up for low earners, 
is uh, good news. So individuals who are uh, below the personal tax allowance up until now haven't had any top up from the government, um, but now they are going to receive a 20% top up to their pension savings. That's very good news. And again, if you're an employer, um, making sure that you're uh, aware of some of these issues can help you um, explain to your staff that even if you're not able to um, pay at a huge level, they can still access um, other benefits. And if you're helping them on that, then that all uh, helps mitigate the fact that you may not be able to pay them as much. That's the theory anyway. Capital taxes, so moving away from income taxes, capital gains tax exemption, we've already heard that it's going to be frozen at 12,300 for several more years. A uh, business asset disposal relief that used to be called entrepreneurs relief that remains at a million. There have been um, a number of suggestions that there would be some fairly hefty changes to capital gains tax, including potentially restrictions to business asset disposal relief, um, as well as reviews of other reliefs. There have been a number of consultations, calls for evidence, but so far nothing is changing. Similarly, on inheritance tax, the nil rate band is frozen until 2025-26 and the residence um, nil rate band, so the value of your property that you can um, have um, a benefit from at death has also remained unchanged. And again, there have been um, a number of papers on reforming inheritance tax, including some major uh, potential changes, such as um, taking away the current tax-free uplift on death. It's uh, perhaps not much comfort, but at the moment, if you die, um, you don't have a capital gains tax charge. You may not be around to appreciate it, but um, that's the case. However, there is a suggestion in one of the policy papers that um, that might go. So if um, you um, in certain circumstances, if you have business assets, there there might not your um, your descendants may not be able to um, inherit them ta completely tax free. Nothing has come out. Nothing has been announced on that, and I think that's possibly because the pandemic has focused minds on other things, and it's not really uh, people haven't got time to look in detail at the consequences of implementing changes. Similarly, we had um, a group a little while ago who proposed a wealth tax uh, in order to pay for some of the pandemic funding. And there's nothing in this autumn statement which suggests that any of these changes are being looked at in detail or coming soon. But it's always wise to bear potential changes in mind when you're looking at medium to long term planning. We would always caution against um, changing things drastically in case something might happen. Because if that thing doesn't happen, then you've you've changed your plans unnecessarily. But um, bear in mind that things may happen, take advice, and then review that advice regularly. So don't assume that what you plan now will work five years down the line. One of the things, just a few things that were announced, just to reassure you that uh, something did happen. Um, one of the things that uh, has um, been difficult for a lot of clients is that a few years ago it was announced that if you, as a UK resident, disposed of residential property, you had to calculate um, any gain and then pay the tax within 30 days of completion. That um, is obviously um, a very good revenue raiser, but it's um, very difficult um, in practice. As anyone who's ever gone through property sales will know, um, getting information confirmed is time consuming. Confirming all of your costs can be difficult. And in particular, confirming all of your um, your purchase price, all of the pri all of the money you've paid on enhancements, um, can take time to pull together a computation and even making sure that you've got enough of the proceeds paid out to you in order to fund the tax bill in 30 days can be difficult. The um, administration process on the online system with the revenue is also not straightforward. 
So there's been a great deal of um, pressure put on the revenue to change that. And um, it's really good news that they have. They've extended the deadline to 60 days rather than 30. So although that may not seem um, much, that extra time should really help, particularly because um, uh, agents especially have had time to get used to the system and can um, generally get it to work. This applies to anything, any purchase completed or sale completed on or after the 27th of October. So we're now in this new period. But just be careful. So if you've already sold something and it completed before the on or before the 27th, you're still within that 30 day rule. So you need to be getting advice now. The um, rules apply to residents, as I explained, who sell non, uh, who sell residential property or dispose of residential property, but it also applies to non-residents who make any qualifying disposal. So if you're a non-UK resident, um, you, you're within these rules, um, but you have now got a little bit extra time. The dormant assets regime I won't go into in any great detail, but just to note that this is a change. There are certain circumstances where banks are able to uh, put money that's been unclaimed um, to donate, is, is it, donate those funds to charitable causes. And um, these rules relate to that. I won't go into them any, in any detail, but if you want to know more detail, uh, then obviously let us know. And I think that's the end of my slides. So I will stop sharing and then I will hand back to Richard. That's brilliant, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of great insight there. Um, of course, Labour want Labour want the, to to frame the winners as being the, uh, the the champagne sipping bankers. And you know, being a Friday, we will be popping the champagne cokes here at Arch. <laughs> Um, probably around lunchtime. Um, but, but in your opinion, who, who are the real winners? Is there a sort of standout winner um, with regards to personal tax? I don't think so, really. Not in the short term. Um, I think uh, everybody is going to be paying more tax now. Uh, the Chancellor made a big point um, and has made the point repeatedly that he's a uh, conservative and he doesn't want to be increasing taxes. So it's um, uh, take the medicine now for most people and maybe have a benefit later um, when tax rates are due to decrease. And those who um, may see some advantage um, are those who are most vulnerable with the changes for universal credit. But because of the increase in national insurance, even those people working at earning at quite a low level will st still suffer from these increased taxes. Yeah, yeah. OK, brilliant. Jam tomorrow, let's hope. Um, <laughs> Guys, uh, I'm sure you all enjoyed that. I'm sure you found it insightful. Questions in the Q&A box, which is down the bottom. I've seen we've got uh, uh, some coming through already. That's brilliant. We'll get to them um, at the end. Uh, and now I'll pass over to Colin. Colin, so the floor is yours, sir. Great. Thank you. Um, so if I just share my screen. Right. So you should all be able to see that. Um, so what I'm going to basically be talking about is corporate and business tax and just covering some of the main changes there as they do um, affect businesses. So I think the first thing I would say is that the budget was reasonably light, certainly on corporation tax matters, but there were some still some quite um, important tweaks in there. Um, and some important ones have been pre-announced already um, in that we already know that there's going to be quite a big hike in the corporation tax rate in 2023. There are a few small changes on cap allowances and a few other bits, but on um, other business matters, we've got some quite big items on um, taxing partnerships, sole traders, unincorporated business, and there's a new tax for larger property developers. So just to move through those in a little bit more detail, if we look first at the corporation tax rates, that's moving up to 25%, which is actually a, it's a big increase. It's 19 at the moment. Um, so it's going up by sort of around about um, a third effectively. And that's going to affect all companies 
that make profits well over 50,000, you, you'll reach the full rate when you get to quarter of a million pounds and between 50,000 pounds, where the rate is 19%, you effectively get a marginal band, which is something we haven't seen for quite a lot of years, where the rate um, goes up to about 26.5%. There's a, a catch up rate to, to reach that 25% by the time you reach quarter of a million. I think as we get nearer the date, it's going to be increasingly important for businesses to think about the timing of expenditure. Because obviously, if you spend money now, you'll get 19% corporation tax relief. If you spend it after 2023, you're going to get a greater measure of relief. So, for example, if you've got, I don't know, maybe your offices need a tidy up um, and you want to do a bit of a refurbishment and it's going to be pretty much be repairs it's going to effectively be cheaper doing it after 2023 because of the extra tax relief. Um, so I think timing is going to become an increasing factor. And we've got a similar thing with capital expenditure, but the picture there is a bit more complicated because we've got some extra reliefs at the moment, which are timed to disappear by then. So I'll touch on that again as I go through the capital reliefs, but there is quite a major thing over the next few years with the really large shifts in tax rates on timing of expenditure and planning everything out. So if we have a look at the, um, the annual investment allowance, this was probably one of the larger allowances because this allowance came in quite a lot of years ago and there's what they call a permanent rate, which is 200,000. So that's the normal rate, but they put it up to a million pounds a couple of years ago. And this limit, basically, that's the amount you can go out and spend on an asset and get a straight tax relief. So if you are a haulage company, you go and buy a lorry for £150,000, you can take £150,000 deduction effectively from your profits effectively and, and get 19% of that amount as tax relief. Um, and there used to be a limit of £200,000 that you could go out and spend. So if you wanted to spend half a million, then um, you'd find that over the 200,000, you'd only get a very slow write-off of allowances. So to encourage expenditure, they lifted that limit. It was due to end in December this year, but they basically said it's going to carry on until March 23, which is the date on which the corporation tax go, goes up. So basically, it's to encourage you to spend money to that point. And this relief is available for any business that claims that um, is sort of taxable effectively. So you can claim it as a company, you can claim it as a sole trader, you can claim it as a partnership. One thing I would say is there are complicated rules, and I've talked before about planning the timing of your expenditure. It's not as simple. If you've got an accounting period that straddles the April 23 date, it's not the type of thing where you can go out in March 23 and spend a million pounds and you'll get full relief. Um, there's a rather complicated um, calculation for working out what the limit is as you approach that date. So I think if you have got large expenditure planned for around about 23, then it's really important to consider those limits and get appropriate advice and make sure you really do understand what the limit is at the time you spend the money. Um, super deduction is the other tax relief for capital items that came in in about March, April time, but it came in in the March budget. And that's basically almost a boost relief in that um, if you go out and buy a piece of equipment for say 10,000 pounds, then the revenue will, or the government will allow you to increase the cost of that asset for capital lands purposes by 30%. So instead of taking £10,000 and claiming tax relief on that, you take £10,000, uplift it to £13,000, and then claim tax relief on that. So it means that you're getting much more tax relief on buying those things at the moment. Um, there are restrictions on that. It's only available to companies, for example. So that's obviously quite a key restriction if you're an unincorporated business. One of the restrictions that was around on it was that you couldn't um, claim it if you were leasing out the assets. So basically for a leasing type business, you couldn't go and buy assets, lease them out and claim that relief. Um, there was some confusion and doubt about the position if you were say a property company and you had to put signs, you had to put air conditioning, 
things like that in a building could you get it then because you then be renting out the building and the announcement in the budget was yes you can claim it in that circumstance so it puts that bit um, beyond doubt it's there's a, there is always a choice when you're claiming the relief as whether you claim the annual investments lands or the super deduction because the super deduction effectively goes into its own pool so if you sell that item, there's a clawback quite quickly, whereas annual investment allowance, if you sell it, it's in your main pool with a lot of other assets so it won't necessarily lead to a quick, a quick clawback of the allowances if, if you're going to dispose of it. So again, it's one of those things you've got to plan quite carefully where it goes, what relief you claim. Research and development, there was quite a lot in the government's um, budget speech on the R&D and the direction of the country and the importance of R&D to this country effectively. Um, one of the announcements was around the funding available to Innovate UK, and that's a body that supports um, investment projects in, in R&D. But in terms of the actual R&D tax credits, then there are a couple of announcements on that. Um, one was around just expanding the types of activity on which you can claim the relief. And it's now been extended to cloud computing and data costs, um, which is really just coming up with modern science effectively. The second one is in connection with the location of the qualifying R&D activities. So if you're a company in the UK and you manufacture something and you're having some problems with your manufacture, um, you need to solve a problem. You need to kind of work out the solution to it. So you go to another company to solve that problem. In the past, you could go to an overseas company and still claim a measure of R&D tax credit. What they're basically saying now is that that research has got to be done in the UK. Um, so it's basic to keep R&D in the UK effectively. We haven't got much detail. There will be a finance bill soon. And at that point, we will know more about how these changes will work. The other thing around that was announced in connection with that is that the government is looking at improving compliance, targeting abuse. And I would say that of all the tax reliefs, I, I always get the impression with R&D that there's an awful lot of companies that could claim it and don't because um, they don't consider themselves maybe companies that do research. There's just a problem they're solving effectively. Um, and the, um, the second issue is that, um, that they, um, that there are a lot of companies effectively who, um, who do make the claims, but actually because it's very subjective, maybe are making the claims and they possibly shouldn't do. So I think we're gonna see more scrutiny around that going forward. In terms of cross-border relief, um, there were a couple of announcements on that. Obviously, these are a little bit affected by Brexit because there used to be um, a relief whereby, if, for example, you had a company in the UK, you own a company in the UK, and there's a subsidiary, say, in Germany, and that German subsidiary makes a loss, you could previously offset the loss um, of the German company against the profits of the UK company. Um, but that was only restricted to the EU. So if it were a company in America, you couldn't offset that loss. So what they've basically done is they've said, well, that doesn't make some sense effectively after Brexit. So now you can't set the losses against the profits of the UK company. They've also brought in a relief that if you say got German company with a permanent establishment in the UK, so an office, a physical office where they do things, and maybe that German company has got its own subsidiary in the UK, then um, effectively you can set the loss of that German holding company against the profits of the UK subsidiary. So there is a relief there. So I think the main message is that if you're part of an international group, the tax position you've got is now different effectively. In terms of business rates, we've seen quite a number of changes there. Um, Basically, just to run through those, we know that the areas such as retail, hospitality, leisure, they have really struggled, obviously, through the pandemic. And the government's been very keen to give some extra reliefs for um, those sectors to help them get back on their feet. 
So they've announced that there's going to be a 50% discount for a 12 month period up to a cash amount of £110,000 per business. It's also um, been announced that multiply, this is the amount you've got a rateable value for your property, but then there's a multiplier that determines the rates bill and that's going to be frozen. So that will effectively um, stop the rates going up. Um, there was always a, a relief where if you invest in your property, so you, you basically extended it, improved it, that would normally lead to a, an instant increase in your rates bill. But what they've said now is that there'll be a period where it doesn't increase and then it will go forward and start increasing again. We've also got um, some reliefs around energy generation. This is part of the sort of green energy thing. And there's a particular thing where it's extended to heat networks where effectively you have a heating system that's shared by a number of businesses. And that's something that from a green energy point of view, the, the government's been keen to promote. And other measures are that in 2017, there was a big property revaluation and that really did hit some businesses. Um, and there's some caps on that. There were previously caps, but they've been extended. And then finally, we've got some reliefs for low value empty properties. So those are, are basically cheaper properties um, which haven't been used for a while effectively. They can use a, a, small, business, a small business multiplier on the standard ones. They pay less rates. Other areas we've got, so we've got, um, and this is actually one of the larger announcements. It was one that was to an extent expected because there's been various papers out on it. But basically the issue is that if you're a, a sole trader or you're a partnership and you're not a property, you don't deal in, you don't, it's not property rentals, it's a trading partnership or a trading sole tradership, you can basically pick your year end. So if you have a year end that isn't, 31 March or isn't 5th of April, then you effectively pay tax on the accounting period ending in that tax year. So if your year end is 31 October, for example, you'd have a year end about to come up um, on October 21. And you would pay the tax, you put those figures on your tax return to 5th of April 22. Um, so, and that, that's how you go year to year. And that is called um, effectively the current year basis, and that's how you're taxed. What the government have said is that they'll put everyone onto a tax year basis. So effectively, you can keep your year ends in October, but you have to calculate your profit that fall actually in this tax year. Um, so effectively, the tax for the period after October, you're going to be paying tax on in the current tax year rather than the next tax year. Now, it sounds quite a minor, minor technical change, but the government are forecasting that this will raise around about £1.7 billion over a five-year period. So for companies that are growing their profits, there's quite a big acceleration of tax that we're going to see. So there, there is going to be quite a in, big impact on that for growing partnerships um, or growing sole traderships that are growing their profits. This comes in from the 24-25 tax year, and there's a transition year in the year before that. Um, so, um, so that's just coming up over the next two or three years. There, are, there is a relief, because obviously there is going to be a big tax bill, but any overlap relief, overlap relief is where you pay tax twice effectively in your first year or so. You can set that against it. And also there's going to be a spreading, so you can spread it, the effect of it over a five year period. So this is going to be quite a big impact. And there's also the administrative, uh, administrative impact, because if you've say got a, this October um, accounting period, for example, um, when you come to do your tax returns, so if, if I was sitting here doing my tax return for this year effectively, you wouldn't necessarily have done your accounts for October 21 at this stage they may not be ready by the end of January effectively. So you've got to estimate a number. Um, so I think for a lot of businesses, it's gonna mean that you end up submitting a tax return and then submitting another one with the actual figures. So it is gonna be a bit more work. And then that gives the question, should you change your year end to 31 March? And for some businesses, you can do that. And for other businesses, for example, the leisure sector, 
where Easter may go either side, and that could lead to very bumpy profits. Or farmers who um, it's much more practical doing your accounts to a point after harvest. So they commonly have September year ends. Um, it's going to be difficult to do that. So there's potentially going to be more tax and more administration in terms of having to file and refile um, tax returns and accounts, which we wouldn't have seen before. The final bit I've got is property developer tax. So this is in connection with the issues over cladding and having to take cladding off buildings and, um, and deal with all that. There's obviously a big cost of this and the government are effectively asking property developers to contribute through an additional tax. So there's going to be a tax rate um, of 4%, but it's only going to hit the very large property developers um, because it's if you make profits of more than £25 million. So it's not going to affect a lot. Um, and it's basically an addition to corporation tax coming in from next April. And that's everything I've got for business. I think my main message is planning over the next few years is critically important. It's critically important if you're planning repair expenditure on when you do it, pre or post the seat, the corporation tax rises. It's critically important if you're planning capital expenditure to make sure you get best relief. And it's important if you're a sole trader or a partnership in thinking about how the changes um, to the basis periods are going to affect your cash flows, what your tax bills are going to look like. So I will hand back to Richard. Yeah, Colin, thank you very much. Now, I have to say a lot of that went straight over the top of my head, um, which I think proves that this country does indeed still mm -hmm. need experts like the ones at Liverpool Blake. Um, Colin, firstly, before we and please keep guys keep your your questions coming in in the Q and A box at the bottom, um, and we'll get to them. Um, but but I wanted to ask a bit more of a broader question, Colin, on what you thought about um, you know on the back of on the back of Brexit and on the back of Boris Johnson's infamous four letter tirade at, at, at business, of course, that we all remember. The Tories have kind of been playing catch up and are desperate to um, to remain seen as the party of business. Do you think that this um, budget overall is is good for business, or or, or, or are we are we is he still got some work to do, Rishi? Yeah, I, I suspect there is a bit of work to do. Um, there's not lots for business. Corporation tax is going to go up, which is obviously um, an issue for business in terms of planning. Things like the capital, the encouragements to invest are, are helpful, but in general, there's not a huge amount in this for business. Um, and I think over the next few years, businesses will be paying more tax. They've got the extra national insurance burden um, on the employer's national insurance um, and extra corporation tax. So it, it's, it's gonna be less good, but obviously with the pandemic, there needs to be some increase in tax somewhere. Yeah, I guess some of that was, was expected. Okay, let's dive into some, some questions and, and guys, please uh, keep them coming in on the, uh, on, the, on the box at the bottom of the screen. Um, Ashley Lewis, uh, on rates relief for retail, can you confirm the cap is per company, i.e. for each operating company, uh, which is a separate limited company rather than group? Uh, Colin, I guess that's one for you. Uh, I'm not absolutely certain. The guidance I've seen, it says per business. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not absolutely certain on that one. You've stumped um, us right from the off. Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get going. Can, let's see if we can stump you with some more. Um, let's have a look. Okay, uh, this is from Springer. I hope that's a person. What a great name that is, if it is. Um, does the business rate discount cap of uh, 110... Oh, this is an interesting one. Okay, so does the business rate discount cap, £110,000 um, 110, apply to each individual store branch? Oh, I think this is the same question that you basically don't know the answer to. Do I thought it was going a different yeah. way. So, so we don't know. We don't know the answer to that, but we'll try and find out. I, I thought it was going along along this route, along the um, the, the rate relief for... Uh, for hospitality um maybe you could talk a little bit about that because this is obviously hospitality has had such a tough time um throughout the pandemic haven't been able to open have then struggled for for staff um when everyone rushed back of course and was desperate to go out and eat and drink and be merry 
is this good news? It's only a year, isn't it, that they can get this fifty percent? Yeah, um, that's discount. right. So yeah. How, how do they go about getting it? Is it is it you know should they be raising a glass to Mr. Sunak? And, and do you think there needs to be more to to is more needed basically? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I, th- I I think it's one of those watching briefs almost because we really don't know what's going to happen over the next twelve months or so in terms of how we're going to bounce back in those sectors. Um, I suspect we're not clear of lockdown risks and that type of thing yet or restrictions. Um, and I suspect if those things do drag on, he's going to need to keep doing things that that benefit those sectors. Yeah, yeah. Um, Natalie, I noticed that the, um, not that I'm quite there yet, although it is looming, um, I noticed that the age for when you can first take your pension has gone up from from 55 to to 57. What if you're 53, 54 now when we're planning on retiring? Do you suddenly have to find work for another three years? How does that work? No, you're okay now because they've uh, the new rules don't come in until 2028. So you've got a bit of you've got a bit of time, and I think that's a deliberate policy because those sorts of people, uh, if they're fortunate enough to be planning to do that, um, are already doing their numbers and making their plans. So no, you'd still be okay. Uh, although obviously you're nowhere near that point, Richard. No, I'm st- yeah, I'm, thirty is looming for me, so I've got a lot of time <laughs> to worry about, about that. Um, <laughs> And do, are we going to see this continue? Because obviously we saw the we saw the um, sixty five becomes it sixty seven now for yeah. when yeah uh, are those things going to carry on moving? Do you think? I mean, where do we stop? How by the time me obviously at twenty five by the time I come to retire, surely it's going to I'm going to be ninety before I can claim my pension. <laughs> this year. Well, if it's any consolation, they've reported recently that life expectancy has started dropping for the first time. So maybe you won't need to worry about it. <laughs> well, it's sitting <laughs> jolly on a Friday morning, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think we, we, we don't know. But um, generally, obviously, there's been um, a trend of increasing life expe- expectancy and also of um, increasing health so that people are working for longer. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me, but I think given all the criticism that there has been of the changes, particularly for um, those women who were expecting to retire at 60 and then mm. um, have had that changed. So um, I, I think it would be obviously be an unpopular move, um, but we'll wait and we'll wait, we'll wait and see. I don't think it's likely, um, certainly for the next few years. And I guess the advice always is do do your planning well in advance. Make sure you're you're ready for retirement at whatever age you decide to do it. That's the key, isn't it? Yes, and I think most um, if you have a if you have a pension, then most pension providers provide um, usually free um, sessions where they'll talk you through your plans. Um, so I think take advantage of that. Uh, it's tempting. I know when you get pension annual pensions details, you look at the paperwork and just file it and think, well, I'll, I don't need to worry about it now. <laughs> but and I don't understand any of it, and it's all very complicated. Um, but I think do take advantage of your pension provider. Uh, look at the information they send you. Um, take a, uh, take advantage if they offer free advice sessions, particularly when you're beginning to think about when you might retire, um, looking at how much you can take out and when and um, the tax implications of that. Yeah. OK, fantastic. Um, OK, here's one. Uh, I think this is probably one for you, Colin. Uh, this is from Carolyn Howell. Um, this is probably a silly question. She says, well, there's no such thing as a silly question when it comes to tax, I don't think. Um, but for employer national insurance increase of 1.25%, when anticipating what that amount will look like as an increase compared to existing costs, how do we calculate that? Uh, it doesn't sound like a silly question at all. Uh, Colin, have you got an answer? Um, well, I suppose in terms of the quantum, it's going to be just based on the sort of wages bill effectively as a sort of rough and ready estimate it'll be a percentage of that um i suppose in terms of amounts it does depend on the sort of nature of the business on how significant it is if you're quite a people heavy business then it's going to be quite a major number um and certainly we've looked at a few clients and it's going to be sort of quite a substantial effect yeah. can i 
chip in at that point because I think actually uh, Susan Bunting, who's put a point um, on, has has essentially answered the question very helpfully. Thank you, Susan. As uh, she's because what's happened, it's not it's not a one point two five percent. It's not a one point two five percent increase in what you're paying. It's it's an in, it's an extra one point two five percent onto your NI uh, rate. So then the um, that obviously means a bigger increase in um, in the charges. So she's suggesting nine percent uh, for employers and ten percent for employees. Okay, does that sound does that sound right? Maybe we should get we should get Susan on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, if you've got any clues about the the previous one that stumped us, then uh, stick it in the <laughs> yeah. Q&A. That would be fantastic. Um, I'm I'm really interested in because if you look at all the pretty much all the headlines and of course this is cleverly um massaged by number 11 there was a lot of leaks beforehand wasn't there even way back we got we got bad we got bad news that was leaked we got good news that was leaked but the takeaway and you know the front of my newspaper on thursday was all about um beer duty it, it, is that because and we've been speaking to landlords and some of them are going yeah it's great and others are saying it's all smoke and mirrors that you know that the money that's going to come off your your average pint is so small it's not going to help us um so was it just about getting good headlines and you know lazy hacks saying yeah let's all get to the boozer or, or or is there actually something in it for for pubs and and uh, and, and bars colin what do you think um yeah i th i think so i mean we um, whether it'll actually be significant enough to sort of change what people drink or or come in there, I'm not I'm not sure. These things tend to be just sort of a few pence when they come through. But I think I think the fact that that, that, that things like um, sort of duty coming down on prosecco and that type of thing may just sort of influence people a little bit to, um, and change a little bit of behaviour. I think the answer to the answer to any tax question is always it depends. But in this case, it really depends how much you drink on whether you'll mm. see much of an advantage. But there are some other things as well. So one of um, our local pubs has, um, which is a community run pub, has uh, received a 90,000 plus grant um, announced yes. in the budget. So um, I think there are other things that can help particular businesses that you know that's not the sort of thing that's going to go to Weatherspoons. um other franchises are available um but i think you know there are some specific things which will help particular types of uh, pub or um, business so making sure that you if you're in that sector you're aware of the sorts of funds that you can apply for because that was one that was one that had to be applied for it didn't come automatically so making sure that you get what you can is always good advice yeah you're quite right you've got to drink a lot of pints of beer to to feel that three pence and it doesn't come until february anyway so you know you, 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 you can't don't up your drinking until february that's, <laughs> that's my advice uh, we've got a question here from Julian King. What is the general opinion on how costs are increasing and how this can all be passed on to retail consumers, particularly with hospitality and increasing NLW rates? Um, a, a, a is it a vicious, a vicious cycle to some degree, Julian asks? Yeah, I think, I think to a certain extent, um, they're so there's an expectation of price increases now, which means that um, they are just going through. It, it's in, it, it, it's so much talked about. People can see the effect on haulage, people can, and supply chains and living wage and everything going up. So I think there is an awful lot of, um, it gives an opportunity for people to pass on costs um, because I think the public know that everything is costing more and therefore prices are going up. So, um, there is going to be quite an inflationary impact over the next few years or the next few months, I suspect. I think that one of the things that can uh, help with that is that certainly during the pandemic, people have really appreciated uh, local provision, local businesses. So I think they they often do accept that they will pay more for what they consider to be a good source of whatever that product is so whether that's your local farm shop or um, your local retailer so I think that uh, can offer some comfort so I think people have um, 
be more accepting of that. The issue, of course, is whether that will continue once um, availability increases. So, for example, on holidays, um, I know that there have been some significant increases in UK holiday prices, um, which perhaps people will bear this year because they didn't feel confident going anywhere else. But whether that will continue next year remains to be seen. So I think there's um, there is a certain risk in um, increasing prices. People may certainly be prepared to pay it for now, but you need to you need to market those increases, if you like, to your customers. Um, explaining why you're doing it, why it offers them benefits, and then trying to protect that position in the future. It's not just um, c- consumer prices, though, is it? And uh, you know, we're seeing, and and this is, you know, the the, the Tories are, are bleating about this, and and perhaps quite rightly, but we're seeing increases in wages as well. How do businesses? How can businesses plan for those increases in wages? Because there is this strange. We've got this strange. Um, almost the impasse whereby uh, we've got a lot of people who are probably going to be changing jobs or changing the sort of job they do or how they do it um, and uh, and lots and lots of available jobs out there and you know think haulage is the great example of course you can get paid probably nearly as much as a as a Lovell Blake tax expert now to be um, to be a long distance lorry driver how do businesses prepare for that longer term or or do we think that that hit that inflationary hit on wages is just going to be shorter term and, and you know, perhaps they shouldn't worry about it beyond the, beyond the short term. My, my, my suspicion is it will be reasonably short term. It will be probably 12 months or so that, that we see this pressure um, and whether it's, it's a sort of consequence of the pandemic and everything catching up and there just not being enough labour and there being sort of less labour anyway. Um, you know, it's, it's factors such as that. So I, I think things will settle down, but I just think there's a period of adjustment. We had such a long period when not much was happening and now everything's getting back to normal. There's a big catch up period and that is cr- creating these pressures, which so I think will gradually disappear. Although I'm interested in your comment, Richard, because um, when I was a, a younger, I did want to be a long distance lorry driver. And if I feel that the prices are the wages for that are going up, I may be I may be addressing that with Colin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, it's supply and demand, isn't it? We, we haven't got enough and we certainly need them. Um, but there's uh, they're, they're, they are in, in very, uh, very difficult to come by long distance lorry drivers. Um, I think. If you want to get a question in, I think you've got you've basically got to do it now um, because I think we've we're going to sort of bring this to a close in the next few minutes. Um, Natalie, let me turn to you just briefly. Is is there any sort of closing statements you'd like to add? Any general thoughts about what we've seen this week and how you think it might play out um, for for personal taxation in the in the next twelve months? And maybe any tips that people think people should just just be looking out for and should be on their radar. I think the one of the messages is going to be that hopefully as we come out of the pandemic, as um, the government have more time to focus on other issues, I would expect to see them coming back to the previous consultations on capital gains tax reform, inheritance tax reform, possibly even looking at wealth taxes. So uh, that doesn't mean that you should go and change everything now. But um, as you should always do anyway, have a look at your medium to long term plans for your business, for your estate planning. Make sure that you are happy with what they are now, but um, then make sure that you keep an eye out, speak to your advisor about what might change um, in the future. Um, and Colin, do you, can I sort of throw the same question to you generally for business? Is there any, you know, what are your tips? What should people be, be looking out for? Um, well, I think the main thing we, we're going to see adjusting in the next few years is obviously after following Brexit, we're just almost settling into um, how things will be going um, sort of forward effectively and how our position in the world is sort of changed. Things like the corporation tax rate going up could be significant we might see that coming back down because that tends to be an attractor for businesses into the UK um, things like some of the, the reliefs around 
R&D and how they deal with those because they want to build the knowledge sector. So I think there is going to be, we've got much more flexibility now. We were quite tied in with a lot of our business things into European rules. So I think there's just going to be a period of adjustment in the next few years where we do see a few changes, and but they're going to be things to, say, make our position in the world work better effectively. Yeah, yeah, quite. I think, I think Richard, sorry, can I just add one, one group of people mm. perhaps not covered by uh, either of those scenarios are the unincorporated business owners, so sole traders, those in partnerships, and they will have a lot of changes over the next few years with basis period reform um, that Colin was talking about earlier, and also with making tax digital for income tax coming in. So I think those types of businesses um, do need to be uh, seeking advice and planning now, because those are substantial changes to the way in which they operate. Um, so they need to be thinking about those now. Excellent. Okay, well, listen, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you all for, for coming. Thanks for all your, your great questions. Um, I'm going to hand over to, to uh, Mark Proctor, the senior partner, just to close up. And then I'm going to go and, and reach for the champagne and toast Rishi and all of us because it, it's just gone nine o'clock. And I am a journalist after all, so I should probably, uh, should probably start on the booze. Mark, thank you very much. Richard, thank you. And uh, firstly, thanks to Natalie and Colin again today for a, an, hopefully an informative presentation. Uh, Richard, thank you to you and all of the team at Archant for supporting our event this morning. And obviously, thanks to everyone that joined us. Uh, I hope you found it useful and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks, Richard. Thanks very much, everybody. That was really good, Natalie. I thought you were brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Really, very good. Okay, super. Thanks, guys. Lovely. Thank you. Bye.